Leaders Program at the uh, International uh, Hospital Federation this year and have been really, really excited about the progress of the program and our participation in it. Uh, we were, uh, got the opportunity to spend the day with them yesterday and were uh, very invigorated and uh, excited to see the impact they'll have on global health. Uh, today's program, you'll get to meet uh, some of the participants. We had 31 total participants. I think we had close to 100 applicants. Uh, those 31 represented 18 countries and five continents. And so we had a very diverse group of, of participants. I hope that uh, those of you in the group uh, will uh, uh, suggest and nominate other or people from your organizations for future uh, participation in the program. Today's program uh, will be moderated by R Dr. Rulon Stacy, who's the director of the graduate program in health administration at the University of Colorado in Denver. And uh, you'll get a chance to see the work of four subgroups of the um, Young Executive Leadership uh, Program, and they'll get to present their work from, the, from their participation. So. With that, I'm really uh, honored to welcome you to the program. And uh, here's the representation of the 2021 uh, Young Executive Leaders. Thanks, Andrew, for um, all of your support for the Young Executive Leader Program. My name is Rulin Stacy. As you've heard, I am the Director of Graduate Programs in Health Administration at the University of Colorado, Denver, and have been involved with the International Hospital Federation for a decade when I, um, since the time I was the Chair of the American College of Healthcare Executives. I'm passionate about what the International Hospital Federation does, and what we've, there is no better example than what we're, we're seeing today. Before we get started, I want to take just a few minutes and thank Andrew and his colleagues for their support of the, um, the program today. And, and um, to those of you in the room, those of you who are joining us online, uh, Whit Kiefer has been so gracious and so supportive in all that we do. Um, he could never say this. I, of course, don't care what anybody thinks about me. That means you hire Whit Kiefer now. That is how this whole thing goes. And um, I encourage you to, to take advantage of that. I also want to recognize um, CJ Bolster and Inga Walter. Did I get that right? Yes. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, for joining the, the committee, leading the committee, really, as we've gone through this. They have been so supportive at every turn. We've been joined by Florian Trumare. And is he here? He's not, but he has, he's a graduate, an, an alum of the Yale program and um, has been so, so helpful to us. I would also want to recognize Risto, who is the the, is joining us today, Matunin, who is the president of IHF. And we could never do this without the board's support, and his being here shows the great support that we have. I think everybody involved in this would know that the, none of this would happen without Sylvia, whose last name I could never pronounce. <laughs> and um, it starts with a B. And Sylvia B. in the back, thank you so much for for all that you've done to make this um, a real realistic. As Andrew mentioned, there are 31 members in this year's class of the Young Executive Leaders Program from 18 countries. They started this process early in the spring and they finish it uh, yesterday and with their report out today. They've divided up into four groups. We're going to hear from each of the four groups today, and we hope that you'll ask us questions as we, um, as we get to the end of the program. We can take those questions here in person. I've been given the technology that if you use your app and you send the questions, they will come to me. I will know who you are, so don't say anything mean. I will, um, and then we'll look forward to that. So at the end of this, we'll take a few minutes for questions and and answers uh, from, the, from the four groups. We will 
Um, those of you joining us virtually, I talked about that. We'll have um, in, in person answers. You can um, use the app at the end, and I think we'll, we'll get everybody engaged in, in how we do this. So with that, we're going to move on. I'm going to introduce each of the groups, and then I'll take my seat, and they can come up here for their presentation. When they sit down, then we'll take questions and answers uh, after that. So we'll first hear from Emil Ackerman. Emil is a co-chair of the subgroup that is working on digital and technology-driven transformations. In his day job, Emil works as the knowledge architect. I've never heard that. I'm in love with that title. <laughs> the knowledge architect at Tampur, Tampur something university in <laughs> Finland. Um, Risto could say it. That. University, where he's responsible for the development and knowledge management and information services of the 9,000 people in the organization. Um, we, at the university in, in, that I'm involved with, we've been doing our own amount of research in this, and I'm very excited to hear, um, hear the, the presentation today. Uh, the second presentation will be given by Don Singerman. Don uh, represents the group working on healthcare transformation and humanistic care. As the Director of Financial Resources at the McGill University um, Health Center in Montreal, Canada, she has the opportunity con to contribute to one of the world's foremost academic health centers and to partner with some of the most passionate and talented and dedicated individuals in the field to deliver world-class healthcare and to develop cutting edge research. We'll then hear from John Cruven. John is the co-chair of the subgroup working on integrated care and value-based transformations. In his day job, he is the senior vice president, um, is a senior vice president at Wellstar Health System and the president of Wellstar Cobb Hospital and Paulding Hospital. Under his leadership, the hospital became the first and only hospital in Georgia to receive the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, which makes him my favorite. I'm so sorry. Hey. Hey. I know, I, you know, <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> we'll then hear from Fatma Al-Jawari and Sarah Al-Shaya. Al Al yes. Yeah. Close? That's right, that's right. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. Um, they, they are representatives of the subgroup working on health workers' well-being. Fatma is head of patient safety and risk management at the Royal Hospital in Oman, and Sarah is the head of operational planning section at the Emirates Health Services in the UAA, UAE, where she advocates for innovation as the guiding principle in developing and endorsing projects. This is very, very exciting. The, the work here that they've done over most of the last year is groundbreaking. And they, along with their alumni colleagues, have set a very high bar for future um, young executive leaders participants. And so with that, Emil, we're turning the floor to you and get into our presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. First of all, it's, it's really great to be here, to see people in person. I'm really happy about that. All right, um, so our subgroup was the, uh, focusing on the theme of digital and technology driven transformations. Um, I'd like to first talk a little bit about our team, which is an amazing team. We had nine great professionals involved. Today we have four of them uh, on, uh, on site, including me, Leandro, Sudha, and Katya, and, and others are uh, watching this uh, via internet. Uh, also, I'd like to give a special thanks to Taylor, who was our uh, co-chair, who, who really led by example and, and really did a lot of work uh, in our group. Let's move on then to the research question that we had. 
uh, how are different healthcare systems around the globe utilizing digital technologies to drive systemic change? Um, we divided that uh, question into four different themes. DTTs are abbreviation for the digital and technology driven transformation. So the themes were uh, related to patient-centered care, COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, general benefits and drawbacks of uh, transformations in healthcare, and mobile health and telehealth. Um, about the deliverables, um, the requirement was uh, for deliverables, so obviously we got a bit too excited. So <clears throat> we, we published one opinion article, one blog post, which, which is an understatement, which you will see later, uh, four webcast episodes and ten podcast episodes. So uh, a lot of stuff. And when I'm about to tell you about the key takeaways, you understand that we, we ourselves, we learned a lot, got, an, uh, got new experiences, um, but now the key takeaways will focus on what, what's there to be taken away by, by the audience. And uh, these are presented, uh, divided into separate uh, deliverables that we had. So first deliverable was the opinion article, evaluating digital and technology-driven transformations, taking the soft approach. Uh, basically, uh, we developed a framework, which you can see on the right-hand side. Um, soft is, uh, uh, stands for social, operational, financial, and technical dimensions. Um, the idea was that we need a framework to be utilized by managers to systematically evaluate digital transformations. Uh, we also tried the framework ourselves. Um, through our analysis, we identified benefits concentrating mostly on the operational side, like access to care, quality of care, and financial side, <coughs> like um, decreasing the costs. Then again, potential drawbacks concentrated mostly on the social side, related to change management, change resistance, burnout, and technical side, such as data privacy, IT infrastructure. But um, the point here is that there's a framework that anybody in the healthcare sector could use while thinking about moving forward with their digital uh, trend, uh, projects uh, transforming their organization. This is a framework that could be utilized in terms of um, looking at from different angles what could be the potential drawbacks or, or benefits that uh, should be either avoided or sought for. Uh, there's a link uh, under the slide that uh, uh, you can get access to this particular article in the IHF website. Now, this was the first deliverable. The second one was the so-called blog post, the impact of uh, digital transformation on patient experience, reflections on patient-centered care from around the world. Uh, first, we did a literature review, quite extensive, uh, which suggests that digital transformation of healthcare has a positive impact on patient experience. Then, um, we uh, conducted an international survey to which we got uh, uh, responses uh, from five different regions around the world. We had 86 respondents. And the themes that uh, we discussed in, in the survey were related to uh, general perspectives on, on uh, digital tools that the, the patients are using, uh, evolution of the patient-provider relationship opinions on vir virtual care, and what makes healthcare technologies user-friendly. Um, our our um, results suggest that the findings, the findings are consistent with literature review uh, and also across re regions, so there were no significant differences there. Um, there, were, there were many positive aspects um, raised up, such as uh, accessibility of information, and easier contact to staff uh, through digital tools and channels. Uh, on the negative side, they were mostly concentrating on the as um, related to feeling of lack of empathy while using the digital tools. 
we were also speculating that uh, it might be that the generations of digital natives uh, now and in the future might not feel such a lack of uh, empathy related to virtual care and virtual channels than uh, the people might ha have that, that were in our um, that were respondents to our survey. But all in all, uh, it's a great article. You can go access it through the link. Um, it really gives perspectives on how pa actual patients, uh, what, they, what do they think about the technologies that are um, offered to them. Moving on to the third deliverable, which was Digitech Health Leadership Talks webcast series uh, on telehealth and mHealth. Here you can see uh, five themes that were um, identified from, from the interviews with uh, experts around the world. Uh, the first interview was with Henrik Martins from Portugal. And there the discussion was related to the need to create infra infrastructure for rapid cycle experimentation in diverse populations. Uh, that, um, the main point here is that you should really experiment on, uh, on telehealth, trying different things, and, and from there you should be able to, to form a criteria to be used uh, in order to uh, identify which areas telehealth should be used and especially where it should not be used. So th this is very important so that it's, it's not a solution for everything. Uh, with the second interview, we uh, interviewed Diran Abidakun from Nigeria, and there the discussion was related to gaps in legislation and policy uh, that can slow the adoption of telehealth and mHealth. And uh, we, we uh, understood that this is a problem in many countries, so there might be very um, big plans in, in uh, enhancing and improving telehealth, scaling it up, but it might be that um, legislation um, kind of uh, slows that down, which needs to be taken into account. The third one was with uh, Dr. Harish Pillai from India. Um, there, the discussion was about the opportunity to recenter care delivery around home and community based settings using omni channel digital health. The main idea here is that. Uh, there are diverse use cases for the telehealth, uh, starting from um, virtual uh, intensive care units to, uh, let's say, virtual home care. So it, it's, it's all about using different ways and channels to tackle the different needs. And the fourth one was with uh, Philip Costa from Portugal um, about dissemination of trust among stakeholders uh, towards, towards technology, which is needed, and changing education and learning methodology of professionals. So altogether, these things, what you see on the slide, are something that really need to be kept in mind if you are um, moving forward with telehealth solutions. Uh, you can see the uh, webcasts uh, at the IHF's um, website. The fourth. Last but not least, least uh, from the deliverables is the Digitech Health Leadership Talks podcast series on digital technologies used in the fight against COVID-19. Um, I said there were 10 podcasts, so I won't be going through uh, takeaways of all of them separately. Here you can see some of the quotes from there. Uh, we uh, want to raise up uh, three different things, key points here, that were quite mutual. Um, in, in the, those podcasts. First, uh, leaders worldwide believe that data sharing is paramount. Public health is not a competition. And this is basically what, what the International Hospital Federation is all about as well, to, to really share experiences, mistakes, uh, anything that, that you have learned. And, and with that, we, are, we can all get uh, uh, better and, and improve our operations. Second, vaccination is just one tool in the fight against COVID-19. Um, there are public health measures, different technologies that remain essential in the fight against the pandemic. Third, 
the greatest gains can be made in the developing world, and we should really focus our efforts on bringing, bringing medical resources to developing countries and also helping, um, um, helping them to learn from the mistakes some other countries have already made so that not everybody has to do all the same mistakes all, all over again. And I'd like to uh, end this presentation with an uh, in interactive part. So I would like to, uh, the audience to raise hand um, if they are still using physical maps and a compass to find out where to go. So raise a hand if you're doing that. Okay, no, no hands. I, I was thinking if there's somebody uh, orienteering or something, but but okay. What about uh, how how many of you raise hand raise a hand if you are using routinely either Google Maps or Car Navigator, such uh, uh, similar apps to get around? So very uh, almost everybody. So basically, uh, based on our experience, what we have during our work, what we have read, what we have learned, what we have had interviews with people, and so on we really see that this, this type of a change is coming to healthcare through digital and technology related um, transformations. And um, it's not only about the technology itself. We also have to change the way we are working, uh, uh, change our behavior, and only then we have a kind of a, um, sound solutions that really help us to improve. And, and that's where I would like to conclude this presentation. Thank you. So Rulon, did you want questions now or yeah. later? Thanks. You just figure out how to use this glue? Nope, broke that. All right, good afternoon everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having my team and I here. It is our pleasure to present on behalf of the young executive leaders. Um, how do we ensure humanistic care in a transforming healthcare environment? So first I'd list, like my team to stand up, those of you who are here. So we have Rachel who is my co-chair, Marcio and Heike are here, and Antonio is right there. His book is being released this week. Please go see him. Um, we're really proud to come from across, uh, across the globe to bring to you this notion. So to start with it, when we were thinking, what is humanistic care and what does that mean? We were really inspired by Margaret Mead, who is an anthropologist. And many, many years ago, she was asked by her students, what is the first sign of civilization? How does she identify what was the first sign of civilization in ancient cultures? And all of her students expected her to say, uh, you know, primitive tools and fish hooks and bowls and pottery. But she surprised everybody by saying it was actually finding evidence of a healed femur. Because in the animal world, if you break a bone, it's game over. You can't hunt, you can't defend yourself, you can't protect yourself. And it was like that for humans for a very long time. But she said, once you start seeing in a culture healed bones, it shows that somebody took the time to care for somebody who is wounded and they tended to their wounds and they protected them and they fed them. And this is really what she considered the first sign of civilization and is what we really consider is the core of what is humanistic care. It is what is it about humans that makes us go out of our way to care for each other. And that's really what healthcare is to us. So, Humanistic-centered healthcare, we all know that since the beginning, the World Health Organization has declared that healthcare is a fundamental human right. And it has been declared that all humans should have equitable access to quality healthcare to ensure the best outcomes possible. We know everyone is unique, everyone's situation is unique. We'll never have equal healthcare results across the board, but how do you make sure everyone has the best possible outcomes for themselves? So to examine this topic, we were looking at it at how do you keep that patient at the center of everything that we do? Because our healthcare networks really surround our patients, their families, and our communities. But there's so many 
changes that are happening rapidly in our environment today. And we listed some above there, but when you really look, we're in a global pandemic, that's a new one. But there's also cybersecurity, there's now that there's such a dependence on the global supply chain, there's telemedicine that's really coming out. There's a lot about artificial intelligence that's really changing the healthcare space. So with all of these changes going on, how do we remember that at the core of everything we do is really the patient, their families, and their communities? So we focused really on three different subjects when our groups did their work. The first was on what is health equity? What does it mean? How does it impact the work that we do? What is patient-centered care? And the last one, which is very pertinent in the world today, is how do we handle all of the patient data in an ethical manner and remember that patients are not just a bunch of zeros and ones and they're not just a bunch of information and data, but there's still a person underneath all of that who's looking to us to help care for them. So health equity is based on the notion that we know there's many, many systemic barriers to health in the world today. Uh, if you take anything from racism, poverty, uh, employment status, education, all of these have resulted that there's different groups of people, unfortunately, in all the countries that we come from, in all the regions that we come from, in all the cities that we come from, there are still systemic barriers that some of our patients are facing to get access to healthcare. And those are translating into lower healthcare outcomes across many different spectrums. And whether you measure it on mortality rates, whether you measure it on infant mortality, malnutrition, on life expectancy, on the rates of certain cancers and heart diseases in different populations, the fact remains that certain people don't have the same access to healthcare and they will not have the same outcomes as other people. So what can we as healthcare providers do to make sure we're removing those barriers to care and we're remembering to put the patients first. So one thing you'll hear me talk about a lot today, if my slide would change. This is not working very well. I'm going to ask for some help to move the slide, but I'll start talking about it anyways. Um, one of the best practices that our group said we have to focus, focus on is really education. It's by educating our healthcare providers to recognize what are the local populations that don't have the equitable access to healthcare, what are the local um, traditions, how can those be incorporated, how can those be considered? Oh, okay, we're moving forward at least. Um, and those were some of the things we looked at in the examples from our own home countries that we studied. Um, so obviously my portion was on the indigenous population in Canada. That is a community that my hospital center is part of serving. And that is one that is really an underserved community. That even if Canada is one of the most developed nations in the world, we really do um, lag behind when it comes to taking care of our indigenous populations and all the healthcare outcomes I mentioned before from substance, substance abuse, suicide rates, life expectancy, they are lower. So education is a really big part of what we do at our hospital to understand what are the impacts that influence those. Um, if we look, the other important part is giving a patient a voice. We're very lucky in most of the healthcare establishments where my team and I work that we have user groups and patient advocates and ombuds programs who are there to support the patients and their families, help them navigate through the system, and help especially an ombuds program for those patients to have a voice when they don't feel like they're getting adequate care or when they're uncomfortable in a system that doesn't necessarily understand their reality and their needs. Improving access to care, one of the great things about telemedicine is it can help us reach remote communities, but there's still a lot left to do to make sure that we're adapting our protocols, that we have the right translation services in place. And the last thing to remember is many of us here are, all of us here are part of the healthcare network, but healthcare policy alone is not gonna solve some of these systemic barriers. There's really pieces that have to do with economic policy, with social policy, with education, and we really have to work on a cross-functional framework with our governments to make sure that people are not falling between the cracks. Next, we looked at patient-centered care. 
And there's numerous studies from all over the world that will show that giving patients a voice in their own care is really gonna help improve the outcomes. Gone are the days where doctor knows best and he told you what to do and you didn't question it and you didn't understand it. It's really now about involving the patients and their families in their care. So how to treat patients with dignity and respect, how to make sure that information is being shared with the patient, how to get them to participate actively in their care trajectory and how to collaborate with it. So again, we were really focused on best practices and what can we share with others, examples we've seen, examples we've studied. Education is a big one. The more your patients know about how the system works, the more the physicians and the nurses and the healthcare workers know about how to involve their patients, the better everyone is going to be. Again, user groups, patient council, ombuds program, all of those have been proven in the research to be really important about how you keep the patient at the center of the care. And if you don't have those types of groups in your own establishments, I strongly encourage you to look at implementing them. We had a couple of great examples in our group about actual applications that were developed by hospitals to help patients. So where I'm from, the McGill University Health Center, we developed the OPAL app, which actually puts all of the patient data in the palm of their hands. It shows them all of their upcoming appointments, all of their blood results, everything about the trajectory. So when they go see their general practitioner, they have all the information at the palm of their hands. They can understand all of their results and they can reach their physician at any point of the day through a quick um, messaging application. And the last thing is really just to learn about best practices at other institutions and how can you use those to encourage information sharing with your patients. The last piece we looked at was ethical considerations for managing healthcare data. And to do this, we conducted a survey of um, a bunch of respondents from across six countries. As you can see, most of our respondents actually had over 30 years of experience in the healthcare sector. So these were people who really lived through the paper-based era and are now seeing everything that artificial intelligence and digital transformation is bringing and how much it's changing healthcare. 100% of these respondents unanimously agreed that there is a strong ethical obligation in how we govern healthcare data. Yes, it's exciting. Yes, there's a lot of great things that's going to come out of this data, but if we don't have the right governance structure, we are going to fail. And one of the positive indicators was that 87% of the people that we surveyed felt like their institutions had a solid grasp on what were the ethical considerations and that they were treating these questions appropriately. But we also asked them, what are their top concerns when it comes to digitizing healthcare? Um, what will surprise nobody is the number one answer was cyber attacks. We've all seen many institutions that have been held hostage and ransomware for patient data. A big concern also is how do you anonymize patient data? How do we make sure that when we are building these huge national and international databases to be able to mine the data and study, that we've properly anonymized the data and you can't go back and find the particular patient? And a really interesting area of study, especially if I give the example of uh, medical imaging, is about artificial intelligence. So there's many places where they're working on algorithms to teach an AI how to read images and how to diagnose diseases. And these will be able to work very rapidly since we have a shortage of radiologists to be able to read these imaging reports. But what happens if that algorithm fails? And what happens if it doesn't appropriately diagnose a patient? Who's responsible? How do we put safeguards in the system that we don't become too dependent on AI and we forget that at the end of the day, it is about the patient and making sure each and every individual gets the appropriate care they need. So always best practices. First one's always education. So how much do the people working in your establishments understand cybersecurity, phishing? How are they supposed to handle patient data? How are they supposed to secure patient data? One of the things that surprised us the most is in risk management practices, we found that not all of the organizations we worked with actually had data protection officers. There was no one who was really dedicated to understanding how to protect the data, how to use the data. That's really, really an important role. Um, having independent risk audits 
having people check and validate your processes and procedures are really important as well. And it always comes down to three pillars for handling patient data. One, how do you be really transparent with your patients about how their data is going to be used? Secondly, make sure you have their consent. As this data is being shared more and more national and international databases, do your patients understand that? Do they understand what are the implications? Privacy laws are not the same across the world. So what does it mean if we have patient consent for our own research, and yet many of us are part of these international networks that are sharing this data? And lastly, always make sure the data is safe. How do you protect it? How do you firewall it? How do IT people smarter than I take care of that? Um, so we wanted to end it with another quote from Margaret Mead, where she was talking about how a small group of citizens can make a huge impact to change the world. And that's the only thing that ever did. And that's really how our group feels about this program, um, feels about everything that the IHF is doing. We are part of a very, very lucky group that is going to be able to influence healthcare policy, that's going to be able to influence patient care for the years to come. And it's really, really a privilege to be able to do that. And I thank you all for listening us, to us today and giving us the chance to uh, make a little impact in this very big world. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I have to start with a couple of thank yous, um, certainly to the IHF and to Whit Kiefer. I've got to do a lot of uh, leadership development in my career. Um, never have I gotten the opportunity to expand my horizons outside of the U.S. to learn from so many different perspectives and people. Um, and also congratulations to my fellow classmates. I know how much work this was over the last 12 months while all leading in your organizations and across the world during a pandemic. So thank you for giving of your time and help making this experience uh, so great. So our subgroup was asked to think about integration of value. And as it turns out, that's a pretty broad topic um, that is wide, widely different, uh, not just within a country, but across the world. And so today, today we wanna explore the concepts of integration of value. What do these terms mean? in different contexts, cultures, and geographies? How do we implement better integration to drive value? So what do some of those best practices look like? And I would ask that each of you think about your organization and where it may be around integration. Is care at your site a flip of the coin, or is it truly integrated? I have to thank my subgroup. Um, there's uh, two of us here today. Cherie is here in the front as well. Um, but a lot of effort went into the uh, work that you're about to see that I will try to sum up very briefly in 15 minutes uh, based on the work that this group did. But as you can see, we have a wide range of people um, across uh, the globe uh, that helped research and helped us think about this uh, very topic. And so what we've gotten to do and one of the best things was really celebrate our differences and learn from each other and, and see a different perspective outside of what our norm may be. So thank you to this team for giving me um, that opportunity I, I will truly miss and hope we continue some of our uh, conversations of just check-ins of how are things going and how are you dealing with uh, certain things uh, in your area. So as we, let's, I want to start with some definitions around integration because again, this is a broad term and perspectives from different countries may matter here. Um, for instance, in the U.S., integration has a lot of meaning, and it depends on who you ask. It could be integration for a patient. It could be clinical integration. It could be integration from a payer standpoint. But in general, in the U.S., we look at that term uh, broadly, but it's to drive value. And there's lots of different equations for value that we typically use. This is really one of the newer ones that looks at quality and patient experience over direct and indirect cost is how we calculate value uh, sort of in the U.S., a bit different in Poland, and this was fascinating. Fascinating. So Ursula shared with us that in Poland, the notion of integration of value isn't actually focused right now on the patient, but rather on the team member. And so the question of is the work that the team members are doing integrated in a way that they feel like their work is being done efficiently, and does that drive value for the work that they do and give them make them feel um, valued uh, in their work? Um, and she she talked about how this is changing. This shift is changing in Poland to be more patient centric but it's typically been more employee-centric. 
In South Africa, um, a little bit different. There's a, a large private and public sector in South Africa. And so uh, the focus of integration is really around uh, integration of care between these two models, the private and public sector and the inequities between private and public. And then the value for them is the efficient provision of healthcare services to give citizens the best value. And then in Australia, their integration is uh, looked at in a fourfold manner. So to improve health outcomes, deliver higher quality service to the patients, lower costs, and ensure the well-being of the workforce. And here, value is the balance of cost and resources used against the amount of benefit. So we hear a lot of similarities in these, particularly around, uh, around the definition of value. But quite a bit of difference can be found in this notion of integration from country to country. So we're you know, trying to think of what drives that notion, that difference in integration. And we came up with, with several things uh, as we looked globally. Uh, so one, there's some historical power relationships between the private and public sectors that vary from country to country. Depending on how the, the payers are set up, the complexity and, and multiplicity of structures, so how large of an infrastructure is uh, the healthcare system, and then the expectations in each country of providers, purchasers, patients, they all compete sometimes, and what they would call integrated and what drives value for them in their lens may be very different. And then certainly, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the next slide, but how does the payer structure variance across the globe change this notion of integration? And then how healthcare quality is measured and understood. Even within, I know within the US, we don't have a great definition for what is high quality and what do we measure for that? And it can be dozens and dozens and dozens of measurements all looked at differently. And in fact, there are a variety of billboards you could drive through the US and see of how every hospital is number one in the country for something. Right? Because we don't have a clear definition of what drives high quality. And then whether quality is even incentivized. Are we incentivizing quality, efficiency? Are we incentivizing low cost? Are we incentivizing a combination of all of those things? Can vary what drives integration. And then who's responsible? And I think a lot of times in healthcare, everyone's responsible, so nobody becomes responsible. Right? But who's responsible in an organization for uh, integration. And so we started thinking about this notion of can a payer, can our payer system, right, our cover, healthcare coverage system drive integration? And I think one of the most notable differences is that it does seem to be able to drive different levels of integration from the perspective of this group. And in South Africa, right, our, our team member from South Africa talked about um, historically having not great integration, but recently passing a bill that would drive a single-payer system in South Africa. Um, there are other single-payer systems across the globe, certainly. Um, for them, this is they're hoping to bring historically low integration to uh, a higher integration level, but they're not there at this point. In India, we looked at what the payment structure is. There's government, uh, uh, the government pays for basic care for all, um, and then there's supplemented private, supplemental private insurance. Um, but there's a large uninsured for that private uh, population in India. And so there's pockets of integration within the private sector. But because so much of the population does not have that private, uh, a lot of non-integration across the country. In the US, we have a complicated payment system. Um, we have government for some. Uh, we have private for some, so commercial insurance for some. And then we have unfunded costs that are passed back to basically the insured via the, the healthcare system being required by law to care for those that are uninsured. And those costs get passed back to those that have insurance. Um, so we really have a sliding integration in the United States. Those that have commercial payer may have a higher level of integration than those who are underinsured, uninsured, or through some of our Medicaid type insurance. And then in Jordan, we talked about uh, the government for, for some of the population. So if you're a government employee, you have insurance, you have uh, care provided to you. You can have private for some and then a lot of out of pocket as well. Um, and they're seen as a bit more integrated, perhaps, uh, that uh, drives some high quality medical tourism uh, as a destination in the Middle East. Um, I think one thing that was fascinating to note is not one person in our group was ready to say that their country had high levels of integration. I think it's clear that there's a lot of work to be done around this notion of integration. So what does 
potentially best practice for integration look like? The World Health Organization actually has a definition for this best practice um, for improving healthcare integration. It's a coordination and empowering and engaging people, strengthening governance and accountability, reorienting the model of care, coordinating services, and creating an enabling environment. So what could this potentially look like? I wanna explore that just a bit here. So there's a couple of different types. There's vertical integration, right? So vertical integration is where we focus on joining up primary community and hospital-based services that may include payers, suppliers, and, and others to fulfill patient needs, right? So how do we align those things? The value there is to divert human and financial resources from already resource-constrained health systems. So how do we create efficiencies, cost avoidance, and use our, our healthcare system effectively? And then there's this notion of horizontal integration, which is sort of the multidisciplinary teamwork across uh, a patient's care path. And then this would drive our quality and coordinated care. So there's two different types of integration as we think about vertical and horizontal integration. And technology has to be a part of this. Um, I, I would dare anyone to find a single session today or this entire week that did not mention technology or big data. Everyone I've said, and regardless of the topic, has brought up some form of technology and leveraging that. That's going to continue to be the case to help us drive uh, in, uh, efficiency, quality improvement, enhance our customer experience, and cost containment. We heard a little bit about that from our last two speakers, right? And so this can be the Achilles heel of an organization if we aren't thoughtful about how we pay for, implement. Earlier today in a session, um, they, there was a discussion around how leveraging technology should be cost neutral. How many of you feel like your organization is ready to declare that technology is going to be cost neutral? All right. So why don't we all embrace technology to drive integration? There's several clear reasons, right? One is we are all so different, and even within a country, there's different needs based on the organization. And the problem with that is it drives the inability to have out-of-box solutions, right? So everything becomes custom. Um, we have two major electronic medical records in the US. Uh, we have Cerner and we have Epic. And you can't just buy Epic or you can't just buy Cerner, not easily. Almost all of them become so uh, customized that they're, they're different from hospital to hospital, even though they have the same name, right? And that's true across the globe. So we also have this notion of rapid evolution of technology. Every time you buy a cell phone, it is basically disposable because the next year, another one comes out that surpasses everything that one could have done. And you think about where we've come even over the last 10 years where you can have an EKG sitting here right now if you want from your, your watch, right? It can measure your pulse oximetry. So as soon as we are able to adapt technology, it already feels like it's become obsolete, especially when uh, a lot of the technology for healthcare can take years to implement, not days, weeks, or months. Huge barrier. And then lack of user competence, because it changes so quickly, is your staff ready for it and are your patients and consumers gonna use it? Otherwise, it does just become a large dollar amount that you can't afford. So, as we think about integration, how do we operationalize this? How do we create integration? I want to give a couple of examples of what not to do that I feel like we all do. Um, one is we put policies and procedures to everything. If we don't have the answer, then somebody's going to sit and write a policy procedure, and then it ends up in a giant book, and we expect our staff to know how to get to them, when to get to them, what to use, when to use them. And in fact, we have an entire uh, part of our accreditation process that is nothing but checking our policies and procedures to make sure that they're being followed appropriately. And they're certainly necessary in a lot of instances, but I would argue that in many cases they're not. And they're simply because we don't have another solution of how to fix a problem. And then the other one that I love is committees. Um, if, if your organization is anything like the ones I've worked at, um, we, I had an organization, I kid you, we had a committee that oversaw the formation of committees. And it's like, how many, how many barriers can we put in place in order to try and fix the problem um, and not actually address the problem? Because these are easy solutions. We can all do these in a minute. We can put a bunch of people in a room and have them meet every month. We can write policies and procedures. So how do we actually look at integration? Becker's has an interesting take on it. Um, and it says you have to have these things to drive integration. One is uh, you have to impart directional vision. 
Right? This doesn't say you have to have exact tactics for every little thing, but your organization has to understand the direction that you're going. Uh, you have to favor fluid decision making, so we have to be nimble. You have to simplify organizational structure and process, institutionalize leadership, and embrace collaboration. And that takes leadership. This is not easy. Uh, I liked this, this sort of definition of leadership um, that Erica Hirsch, who writes for the Harvard School of Public Health, identified. Leaders have to lead down to your team, but not through authority. They have to lead up to those that we report to to help influence and guide them. We have to lead across the organization to break down silos. And we have to lead beyond the organization by partnering with those external to us, right, as leaders. And one of the ways I believe we can do this, and I, Rulon, thank you for the shout out. Um, once you embrace this Baldrige framework, it becomes kind of part of who you are. And so I'd be remiss not to, to talk about this, but I'm a big believer in the, in the Baldrige framework. And this is, uh, in the U.S., it's our highest quality award. It's given by the President of the United States. Um, it's a framework designed as an operating model. And I would argue that in order to drive integration, we have to have a clear operating model. So how you run your organization and the Baldrige framework challenges us to look at leadership, strategic planning, our processes, our people, how we listen to them, our customers and how we listen to them, and then to measure the things that we do. And so we held this as a, as a best practice in operational modeling and, and, and integration. I encourage you, if you don't know much about it, I'm happy to chat with you. There could be a whole session on that, um, but please take a look at it. And John, just, yes. just FYI. EFQM, okay. Is, is equally um, transformative. Got it, EFQM. Um, so as we think about this, and one of the things that Baldur's, and I'm sure EFQM uh, does, is it drives us to think about what success looks like. And I would argue there's no single metric of success. So if you're like, how do I know I'm integrated? What's the one thing I'm going to measure? Uh, that doesn't, I would argue, exist. And instead, we have to consider this notion of value as we create integration and the components of value and how we measure those. And one thing that I think we absolutely have to do is, is not be mediocre as we compare ourselves. And it's so easy to look at ourselves year over year to see if we're improving or getting better and measure against ourselves or measure against an average. Um, but I would, I would push that we have to measure against best in class uh, for integration. So uh, with that, integration clearly and value are complicated. Um, we, we attempted to tackle this from a, a, a multi-viewpoint and certainly appreciate uh, everyone listening today. I can't think of a more critical topic to drive integration for our patients coming out of a pandemic. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, first of all, uh, it's a great opportunity to have this. And thank you for having us presenting uh, our project today. Uh, myself and Sarah, on behalf of the great group, will be presenting our project, which is about the employee-employer role to support uh, measures for frontline healthcare workers during uh, well-being during the pandemic, which is a multi-country uh, comparative literature review. And here is the great members, uh, chairs by uh, Jamie from Taiwan and Logan from South Africa, starting from the right, Nadine from Jordan, uh, Lara from Nigeria, Linda from Australia, myself from Oman, and Sarah from United Arab Emirates. Unfortunately, only me and Sarah is uh, uh, attending in person this Congress today. So why this topic is, is important and why it's uh, received a lot of attention recently, and it was a big deal, especially in the pandemic, and the importance of maintaining the well-being of the healthcare uh, well-being without them will not be able to fight the pandemic, will not be able to sustain, and the healthcare will be collapsing. As all of us know that the COVID-19 has had a massive influence overall in the uh, labor industry, uh, and this is uh, due to the uh, suffering from unexpected outcomes as a result of the psychological stress. And unfortunately, the healthcare workers being the most vulnerable group uh, for this uh, uh, unexpected outcomes, and this is not surprisingly because they, they are the frontliner who deal and fight with this pandemic. 
and uh, also to their critical role in management of this outbreak. And uh, they were not only dealing with the increase of the volume and intensity of their work, but also they have to uh, also uh, face another uh, unexpected challenges, for example, dealing with unfamiliar working environment, changing in the policies, uh, as you know, and also exposure to unexpected trauma uh, with unfortunately very little time for training and orientation. And this has created a sense of urgency and the need to support those vulnerable, vulnerable group of uh, healthcare uh, workers, and uh, particularly when it comes to their psychological health during the pandemic. So the research purpose was to conduct a multi-country uh, comparative literature review among the seven selected countries, as you can see here in the map, Nigeria, South Africa, Jordan, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Australia, and Taiwan. And this was to explore uh, the employer-employee role in relation to the support measure provided for, uh, to the front, uh, frontline healthcare workers during the pandemic. And this bin has divided later into four sub-questions. Uh, in each of the seven countries, we were uh, exploring the uh, pre-existing, uh, uh, which is pre-COVID, uh, uh, employee well-being legislation, policies, and guidelines. And the second one was to, sub to find out the support measures that are provided for the frontline healthcare workers during the pandemic. And the third question was to what challenges do employers in the seven countries are facing in order to support, uh, provide a support measure to the frontline healthcare workers. And the for fourth one was to also to find out the factors influencing the uh, frontline healthcare workers to comply and to utilize the provided measures and support to them during the pandemic. So the research was uh, a systematic, as I mentioned earlier, a systematic literature review uh, using a scoping review techniques for the literature published using several databases, only uh, published in the seven countries included in this study. And uh, a total of 99 uh, literature sources were reviewed and included in this study. Uh, we grouped them later into themes and summarized them in a standardized table template. And then we did a conversion and we discussed it and the report finally was produced. Starting with sub-question one, and here is the data collection template we use. And if you can see here, uh, we, we looked for in each of the seven countries, all the available documents, policies, acts, legislation, anything that include anything related to well-being of the uh, employees in general. And uh, we, we divided it into focusing on the employee role and employer role. And also what's the important uh, take home messages out of the documents that are valuable pre-COVID. And the findings here, uh, we came to know that across the seven countries, there is definitely documents and policies and regulation when it comes to the well-being of the employees. And uh, we can really, uh, we could really group them and under five main categories, employee awareness of well-being, supporting employees at risk, providing treatment for employees with uh, health problems, changing the organization of work when it comes to annual leaves, for example, leave compensations and uh, uh, other things related to employees, and reintegrating employees within the health, uh, with health problems into the workplace. Uh, we also found that there is a common pre-COVID uh, legal framework existing among the seven countries. Uh, it's mainly touching the occupational safety and health, but yet very little mentioning or addressing the uh, employees' well-being when it comes to the psychological and mental health. Only among the seven countries, United Arab Emirates was the only countries that have started something related to that. And uh, I think it's been only recently, like two years uh, ago, and they have a Ministry of Happiness. And uh, now Sarah will continue on the rest of the presentation. Hello, everyone. So as uh, Fatma, my colleague, mentioned, my name is Sara, and I'm happy to continue our presentation here today. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of the Yale program. Uh, we were very excited to do this research. Uh, it was a literature review uh, that, uh, as Fatma mentioned, um, uh, 
compared 99 systematic uh, literature reviews across seven countries. So this is the um, data collection template for sub-question two. Uh, sub-question two was to explore the employee and the employer role to support the frontline healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in this question, uh, we basically also subdivided it into psychological and non-psychological factors. And the following was the conclusion. Oh, is it this way or this way? I apologize. Okay. Yeah. Um, the following was the conclusion across the seven countries. So the government should incorporate health, well-being, and happiness of the healthcare workers in its goals and strategic directions. Uh, the well-being of healthcare workers is a fundamental component of the healthcare organizational management system, and there is a promising trend towards protecting healthcare workers against uh, occupational risks, and there were robust governmental and institutional responses to crises and emergencies. Uh, next was the data collection template for sub-question three. Sub-question three uh, was the challenges that the employers experience in providing support measures for frontline healthcare workers. Uh, this was uh, subdivided into human resource-related challenges, finance budget-related challenges, infrastructure-related challenges, equipment and stock-related challenges, as well as other challenges, including uh, policies and communications. The findings were as follows. So um, outbreaks, fatigues, burnouts, anxiety, depression, th these were all the uh, psychological um, or most of the psychological uh, factors or impacts from the, from the employers, employees, sorry. This led to shortage of staff. Uh, next was uh, the insufficient funding, funding, which resulted into inadequate PPEs and also uh, challenges with the supply chain. Uh, shortage of medicines, vaccines, as well as implementation of poorly formulated policies. And then infrastructure challenges, where, where we had to re, re, uh, repurpose pre-existing uh, hospitals and facilities in the expense of other services. Data collection uh, template for sub-question four. Sub-question four was um, what was discussed, what were the factors that influenced the frontline healthcare workers and their decision to comply with available support measures? Uh, this was also, again, subdivided into psychological factors, non-psychological factors, uh, like human resource-related factors, finance budget-related factors, infrastructure-related factors, equipment and stock-related factors, and other factors like leadership and policies. Uh, and the findings were that uh, psychological distress, stigma, demotivation, and of course, fear of infection from all the employees, from all the healthcare workers, uh, lack of sufficient facilities, PPEs, and uh, vaccines. Uh, there was no consistent strategy around the financial factors. And there was, of course, staff shortage, inadequate training, and ever-changing policies. Um, the overall conclusion for all the sub-questions and for all the um, re research that we have done that we, all the seven countries must focus on the employee well-being. But it will vary uh, based on several factors, including cultural, societal, financial, and legal. Uh, there was marginal attention that was paid on establishing a holistic approach towards the healthcare workers' well-being, the psychological and the non-psychological, or the psychosocial. Achieving employee well-being was typically the responsibility of the employer. Uh, but of course, well -being, well, well, the well-being necessitates also the workers' determination and the ability to participate in the organization's success. There was a, a need to action in a, to address the employee well-being that requires a broader approach than the traditional occupational health and safety. The recommendations that we came up with uh, was based on, of course, benchmarks and best practices uh, that better collaboration among countries' ministries of health regarding the various regulations pertaining to healthcare workers' well-being. Healthcare facilities should reflect on the responses to the pandemic uh, emergency preparedness should be prioritized uh, in countries' strategic health plans. 
um, and adequate uh, provisions must be made for healthcare financing, leadership, governance, and, and health information management system. Uh, a multi-sectoral approach to developing a framework for protecting the healthcare workers' well-being at all times is potentially very supportive. And uh, efforts must be made to reduce the communications disconnect uh, in the healthcare by passing relevantly and timely and accurate information to avoid rumors. Uh, last but not least, healthcare workers should undergo ongoing training to strengthen their resilience and develop coping mechanisms. Uh, our, our research can be found in the IHF blog as uh, for, for the other three sub, subgroups. And uh, thank you so much for having us here at the Yale program. Thank you. Well, thank you to our um, panelists for those, uh, those wonderful presentations. We have a chance now for questions. I've got the, uh, the app open. If you send a, a question, I will get it. I, I want to follow up with just a couple of questions that uh, have come up. To Sarah and um, Fatma, did, did I hear you correctly that based on the engagement of the employee with the organization, their personal well-being will go up and down. If they're more engaged, if leadership engages the employee more, they will be more healthy at work. Did I, can you talk about that? Did I hear that right? Well, uh, it's definitely one, engaging always the employees in their own, not only in their you know daily activities even in the decision making it makes them always happy and this definitely will increase the employees well being later later on and this you know through even out through uh, my experience in my organization when we started focusing on the employee engagement and we started you know surveying the employees we we came to know so many things that it was really missed by the leaders. They, they, they do not even uh, not being even aware about it. And when we started engaging them and um, uh, involving them in the decision, asking them about their needs, it's definitely, uh, we conducted a survey later on and we came to find that they are a bit happier than the before. So this definitely will help uh, in the employee's well-being. That is fascinating. Thank you. Um, can I add on? So, um, based on evidence based as well, engaging um, uh, uh, healthcare workers or employees in decision making will definitely increase the mental well being and the uh, oh, oh, like the entire well being of the of the uh, employees. Yeah, and it's based on evidence based uh, literature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a significant finding, yes. and uh, I appreciate that. I have I have a question for Don, and then we'll. For those of you who have questions, we'll engage you as well. You have a finance background, correct? I do. You spent 20 minutes talking about touching patients and in, in improving patient care. Um, finance people oftentimes get stereotyped as not caring about that. How do we, how can we help others gain the vision that you clearly have gained, or are we misled in our perception? Um, for starters, I don't think anybody would ever call me normal, um, so there might be that. <laughs> are there people on her team in this group? Would you agree with that? She is not normal? <laughs> oh, <laughs> they plead the fifth, they're scared to even answer. Um, I do think it's it's a misconception. Um, you know, finance always has the reputation. Um, every time I meet the surgeons, or when I first started meeting the surgeons, they would just say, oh good, it's time for the no committee, because <gasps> finance only says no. I think it's more about how do you help people gain another perspective. I spend a lot of time, and one of the things that I would recommend you do with any of your staff that's in administrative positions, 
instead of joking about them living in a dark back office in front of Excel all the time, pull them out into the clinics. And prior to COVID, I used to spend my time walking the units, observing surgeries, seeing what it's like. Because yes, if I spent all my time with my Excel spreadsheet and I spent all my time with my data, I wouldn't be nearly as good at my job as if I've actually been there and I've seen it and I've witnessed what they did. I also was um, somewhere between fortunate and just not thinking when I said I would do it. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I volunteered, I trained with the Red Cross as a patient aide, and I worked in um, one of our elder care homes in Montreal because most of the staff abandoned right at the beginning of the, the first wave that we had in Montreal. So I worked basically April and May in this elder care home, and it really gives you a huge appreciation of what our staff goes through and what they live through. So am I normal? Probably not. Um, sometimes record, in a good way, sometimes in a question. bad way. <laughs> um, but how do you help people gain that perspective? Invite them in. Most of the time, if you have a good finance business partner and you invite them to come see what your staff lives through, come see what the wards, don't talk to them over spreadsheets because accountants will naturally feel very comfortable with that, but bring them in to see and to touch, and that's how you'll get them to understand what this organization is all about. Thank you. Okay, questions from you all. Anybody have? Okay, I'm going to keep going right here, and then Risto, who has the microphone. Hello, everybody. Congratulations on all of you. You are a wonderful group. And I think there are different points of view. USA has lots of resources. Africa, less resources. South America, less resources. So if you want to go to the end of your project, you have to look every position of the different countries. For example, in Europe, I talk about Catalonia, right? Uh, what they were doing, because all the work in this pandemic was for family doctors and emergency medicine doctors that are family doctors. Are, are, no, we don't have the specialty of emergency medicine. So uh, we have that experience that all the hospitals were collapsed, all the critical care units collapse. So what uh, the group was working is that the family doctor has to go to the community no? to avoid coming patients, not for emergency cases. And we have different groups. For example, if you have a patient with um, heart failure, an old patient that is coming every two days to the emergency room, Almost they have several diseases. So we have a program that you say, this patient goes to this group that has all the diseases and you have a director, usually the nurse. So that nurse commands and another nurse controls the patients. And then for example, the patient uh, has uh, there's compensation, they are not good, so maybe they gain weight, they don't answer to the diuretic treatment. So what they do? They run to the emergency room. Then you take care of them, but you write in a paper. This patient belongs to this group, so call the nurse, and then you have to check at home to don't return, you understand? The same with another group. For example, a people that is a heavy drunk never wants to, to go to the group to the heavy drunks to avoid drinking. So the nurse has to, the nurse, the social worker has to work with that patient. If the patient wants to be in that group, so you begin working with that group to avoid that that drunk patient comes every week for the same reason, right? The same for the heavy smokers or the people that get lots of drugs. You see that in La Champla, not only Catalan's people goes to the emergency room. All the tourist people came here 
and they take all the drugs they can. So they go to the emergency room, they are almost unconscious. Well, the tourist people will cannot follow, but there are people that they come again and again. So they go to another part of the group, and then there is a program to convince the patient to follow that program. Because if you're a drug person and you don't want to follow the program, nobody can push you. So you have to decide to enter in that group. If you decide to enter in that group, there is association that the psychiatry, the social worker, the doctors work with that group. So you avoid those patients to come again and again to the emergency room. And now with the COVID, who were the doctors that were in front of all the COVID patients? Only the family doctor, because the neurosurgeon, the surgeon, they cannot go to see this patient. So they were at home or they were in the computer. And all the family doctors should be in the front. That's why most of us had COVID with the consequence, right? Are you a family doctor? Yes, I am. And I had the COVID. I was the first one of, of having the COVID. And I have the speciality of emergency medicine doctor. I am from South America, from Peru. But I came to Spain in 2004, and I was very surprised that here there is no the speciality of emergency medicine doctor. And I have several fellowships, and my speciality is also disaster management. At the beginning of the COVID, it was February, in March, I said to my boss, look, that mask doesn't protect me. I need this if P2 or FP3. You are crazy. You have to use the, the normal one. I got sick. Then at the beginning, we didn't know how the, the disease will go. So is there, a, is there a question for the panel in there? No, the question was that at the beginning, everybody was lost. Then we have the experience of the COVID. After the COVID, we have the, now we are in the period of post-COVID. And it's true that all the group, especially you, have to work with doctors, with nurses, with all the professions that work. And you have to take care first of the professional because the professional has to affront, has to be in the field when the pandemic or epidemic happens. And you know, we have to protect ourselves first, second, and third. It's not possible that the government says, there are no masks, there, there is no F2, you have to use the normal one if you know that you're going to get sick. So let's, let's let the panel respond. Um, the, the, somebody from the team about the healthcare workers respond, and I'd love a, a thought about the whole value transformation of where they're getting care. And, and are we spreading it out? So somebody relative to the, to the workers, how do we address that? So uh, this, this was basically the topic of our research, mm -hmm. the um, well-being uh, of the healthcare workers, the frontline, the people who were dealing with all the COVID patients and um, during the pandemic, of course. We, ha we had discussed the, uh, that some countries had insufficient PPEs, like the masks. Uh, we had also discussed the uh, psychological uh, issues that all the frontline uh, front uh, healthcare workers uh, were going through. In example, uh, uh, the things that you mentioned, um, the burnout, the fatigue. So th these are the things that our research has discussed, and these are the things that we're hoping that all the entire countries across the globe and uh, the countries uh, all over the world will, will consider during, uh, God forbid, any future emergency or crisis. Yeah, I think you're right. But we're in the period of post-COVID. Yes. And now they are uh, working too much in healthcare, in, how to say, social worker mm -hmm. and mental health care. Yes. Because everybody, not only the professionals, True. there are lots of family doctors that they don't work because they continue sick. There are lots of professionals 
that they have the consequence of the COVID because they didn't have the protection, the good protection at the beginning. But that's the past. Now, it's not only the professionals, it's also the population. There is more suicide, there is more drugs, there are more killing each other, you understand? Yeah, so it's a social problem. If you go through our research, we, uh, we did not discuss this in our presentation, but there was uh, so many countries who has done um, so many um, things to prevent uh, the suicide and the burnout and example applications. I'm going to speak about United Arab Emirates. So there was applications um, that was done uh, for the for the frontline healthcare healthcare workers to um, empower their well-being and to prevent them from having the burnouts and the fatigues and the depression. Um, there was programs to um, uh, if, like 15 weeks programs to uh, support them and help them, uh, uh, you know, overcome the pandemic and overcome the post-pandemic, uh, um, you know, the the crisis. What happened? Everything. All 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 countries across the world were having the same issues that you mentioned. Yeah, I, I so, know. That's um, so, so hopefully your country. There is too much work for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thank you so much. Of course, of Let's course. pass it on. Risto had a question, and then back here. Thank you. First of all, <clears throat> excellent presentations. Thank you for that. I, I really enjoyed listening, and, and uh, you, you touched health systems improvement from so many angles. I mean, digital transformation, patient centeredness, and, and value, uh, integration, quality, well being of the staff. They're all very, very relevant topics. And, and uh, in addition to speakers, I'd like to thank all the teams that have, were involved. So th these were excellent. Uh, my question might be a little bit tricky. And well, Roland knows me. I, I like to play the devil's advocate <laughs> every now and then a little bit. So I, I just pick one thing, the broken femur. Mm -hmm. Remember that. So, so the person with a healed fracture of a femur will be at risk of having another fracture somewhere else. So this is an inherent feedback of any health system. The better it functions, it creates actually more need for itself to function. And the and, uh, tricky question is, of course, that, that uh, did you discuss between, this is cross-functional, that really addressed to any one of you. Did you discuss about this uh, total big picture in the sense that actually health system improvement is feeding back to itself. Did you touch that at all? I would take a stab at, at a portion of that, and I think you're correct. Um, however, one of the things we have to highlight, and I think that goes into this notion of value integration, is the preventive part of that, right? So the, the key is to keep them from breaking their leg. <laughs> and so how do we create uh, a system where care is integrated such that um, we highlight more of, of that aspect versus the healing and repetition portion. And then when we do have the healing and repetition portion, how do we assure that they're in the right level of care and the person taking care of them is practicing the highest of their license? Um, and then how are we educating them to say, all right, you've broken your femur, you probably shouldn't be a mountain biker or ride dirt bikes, okay. right? And so how can we look at the... Um, at the risk factors that then could potentially help them stop perpetuating that. So I think it, it comes from us shifting our focus from hospital acute care to pre. Thank so you. We, Good we've answer. Got, we've got time for one more question, but uh, does anybody else want to address that? Yeah, it's a tricky that, question. That, that tricky finish <laughs> question. I would say, although it's... Um, it's somewhat related to the topic my group looked at, but a big part of it um, goes with what John had presented also. How do you integrate, and it's really that cross-section between primary care and specialized care. And so like John said, some of it is preventative and what can the physician do, but there's in a lot of places and a lot of the patient-centered programs where we have of um, social workers or nurses who go um, to where elderly patients are living to make sure they're set up well at home? Do you have the bar in the shower? Do you have to help yourself get on and up? 
So how do you do prevention and how do you make sure you're referring if you've seen the person for a broken femur and you've done the orthopedic surgery, how do we make sure we don't just send them home and say, good luck, hope I don't see you in two months. How do you feed that back to primary care so that that person is cared for at home as well? Email. Yeah, I'd like to continue from that, that uh, a big problem many times in healthcare is that we have silos in our operations. And, and uh, what, what the others were talking about is, is really about, when we're talking about innovation, it, it should often be related to breaking those silos and in such way that uh, something is done before the next problem, which we're talking about preventative care. But um, if, if we are, for example, focusing only on the specialty care, then, then we are not taking the broad enough uh, approach in, in terms of preventing things before the specialty care. Thank you. Okay, one final question. <clears throat> it, uh, my name is Miguel Paiva from Portugal. Uh, provocative question. Is uh, the policies of well-being of um, uh, healthcare uh, professionals a patient-centered policy or not so provocative? Uh, are there borders where the well-being policies for the healthcare uh, pro uh, customers, are there borders where they can transform in non so centered, patient centered policies? Uh, well, during, you know, during reviewing all that policies that uh, have already been and present before COVID, it's, it's mainly focused about employees, not really touching the patient. And I think the patient have another pathway of policy and uh, care management. But whatever we have looked for, it was all about the employees. Maybe, yes, you are right in a point where some can be really transferred to patient and maybe a futurely can be considered. But the currently, whatever we got, it was all about the employees. Don? I would argue that the only way you'll be able to have great quality health care for patients is by taking care of the staff. Because if your staff is exhausted and overworked and burnt out and they're not taking care of their mental or physical health, they're going to do a much better job. I don't want to say because I know we have much staff who's very tired and burned out now and they're trying to do everything for the patient that they can. But if our healthcare workers are in good health, they're going to be in a much better position to care for our patients. So there is definitely a very strong uh, correlation between the two. Thank sure. you. So I, I will say, just as I conclude the session today, uh, in my, my career, I've uh, said in every place I've ever worked to the employees, I expect you to give the best care that our patients have ever had, ever, and in their life. I want them to leave thinking that their care is better than any place they've ever been. But then I will make a promise to you. This will be the best job you've ever had. That's my promise to you. Because And if you don't do your part to that, somebody's going to call you out on it. So if I don't do my part, you call me out. And I gave every employee my cell phone number. Call me and tell me, because I want to know. I, I agree that first we meet the needs of the employees, and then they meet the needs. Behind every co-leader you see up here is a whole team of young executive leaders. Can we, we please join me in thanking this team and everybody behind this team who spent so much time. Um, thank you again to the sponsorship for, from Whit Kiefer to make this possible. Would never have happened without that. Thank you so much, Andrew and your team. Um, the applications for the Young Executive Leaders Program will be launched in December. So get the word out. If you know others who will be interested in this, IHF will be accepting those applications starting in December. Please make sure you share your takeaways from this session and post it in the Congress app and on your social media. Make sure to use the hashtag IHF Barcelona. Uh, recordings from this session will be available on the event platform in an hour or two. 
And tomorrow morning, the session starts at 9 a.m. sharp. So thank you all. Have a good evening. We'll look forward to seeing you for the rest of the meetings. Thank you.